We camp a lot of places without electrical service, so we think about batteries more than most because if we run out of power, our carbon monoxide detector stops working, our propane fridge stops working, our slides won't go in or out, and our electric tongue jack won't go up or down. So yeah, battery power is pretty important to us. Today we're going to talk about how much battery capacity you need, different battery types, and the best ways to keep your batteries charged. So how much battery do you actually need? First of all, batteries are usually measured in amp hours, but amp hours are relative to voltage, and batteries come in 6 volt, 12 volt, 24 volt, and even 48 volt flavors. So I find it better to use watt hours as a measurement instead. You can convert amp hours to watt hours by multiplying by the voltage. So a 12 volt, 100 amp hour battery would have a capacity of 1200 watt hours. And 1200 watt hours means that you could run an average of 100 watts worth of equipment for 12 hours straight, or 200 watts for six hours, or 50 watts for 24 hours. Anything that multiplies out to 1200. You get the idea. So to figure out how much capacity you need, you'll first want to figure out your average consumption in watts. Starting with the basics, lighting often uses more than you think, but LED lights only use a fraction of what traditional incandescent bulbs use. Computers, televisions, and other electronics all add up quickly. For us, Starlink is our largest power drain and can drain nearly 70 watts when transmitting. Honestly, your total consumption number is really difficult to calculate in advance, but if you add up the major stuff, it gives you a rough idea, and then you can go out and see how closely your actual usage matches. But wait, it's not quite as simple as that. You see, certain battery types have something called a depth of discharge limitation that won't let you use their entire capacity. So for that, we need to look at the different battery types. First of all, if you have a motorized RV, you'll have at least two different batteries with two different jobs. Your vehicle battery is the same as what's in any car or truck. It helps run the engine and all of your vehicle's electronic components. The other system is the house battery bank, and that powers all of your RV accessories. A trailer, on the other hand, just has a house battery. There are three main types of batteries used this way. Flooded lead acid, AGM, and lithium ion. Flooded lead acid has been around the longest and considered the old tried and true option, although they have a lot of disadvantages. They're cheap, but they require fluid monitoring and maintenance and lose their charge quickly, even when not in use. And they're slow to charge back up. They're also heavy because, hey, they're made of lead. <laughs> they have a maximum recommended depth of discharge of about 50%, meaning you can only realistically use about half of their capacity. Discharging beyond this level leads to reduced voltage and possible damage to the battery. In terms of lifespan, they'll typically last anywhere from three to five years. AGM batteries are the new tried and true option. They don't require any monitoring or maintenance. They charge faster and don't lose their charges quickly. They're a bit more expensive and still pretty heavy though. They can be discharged as much as 80%, although that's generally not recommended. Discharging beyond 50% on a regular basis will reduce their lifespan. Speaking of which, their overall lifespan is a bit longer too, usually in the four to six year range. Lithium batteries are the latest and greatest option. These batteries require no maintenance and are much lighter. They charge quickly and can be discharged nearly 100%, meaning you can use the entire capacity. They are expensive, but they also last much longer in theory 10 years or more, which means that the cost over time is about even with lead-based batteries, possibly even cheaper depending on how long they last. One disadvantage with lithium-ion batteries though is that they can't be charged in sub-freezing temperatures. To mitigate this problem, they're often mounted inside the heated portion of your rig. That's what I did with ours. This is safe since they don't produce harmful gas like lead-based batteries do. You can also buy self-heated versions, although they obviously use some of their power to maintain temperature then. So now that you've chosen the type of battery you'll be using, you're going to want to keep them charged. There are four main ways to do that, and it's important to understand how each one works. The first one is using your vehicle's engine. 
it turns an alternator, which generates DC power for its own components and to charge the vehicle battery. But it also has some spare capacity that you can use to charge your house battery. Depending on the size of your alternator, this is often a slow charge, but if you're driving long distances, it's a great way to keep your house battery topped up. If you have a trailer, most of them can also be trickle charged via a cable to your vehicle. But be aware that this is very slow charging and also make sure that it's actually connected. We discovered on our very first cross Canada trip that our trailer charging wasn't actually working. And there was a wire in our truck under the hood near the fuse box that needed to be connected first. The second way to charge your battery is through shore power. This is just plugging it into an outlet. Your RV has a device called a converter that, as the name might suggest, converts 110 volt AC power to the 12 volt DC power that your batteries need. It also has a circuit called a charge controller that monitors battery voltage and makes sure that you don't overcharge them. Be aware that older RVs have converters that do not support lithium batteries. So if you upgrade your battery, you may also need to upgrade your converter. I made a separate video about this a while back. Of course, to use shore power, you need to be at a campground or a location with a power outlet. Or do you? The third charging method, generators, produce the same type of 110 volt AC power that outlets do, so that you can have that shore power experience in the middle of nowhere. Mind you, they do tend to be noisy, smelly, and use a significant amount of gas or propane. That's where our fourth method comes in, solar power. Panel prices have come down a lot, giving you cheap, quiet, clean, plentiful energy from the sun. That is, when you're somewhere with a lot of sun. Solar panels obviously don't work well anywhere with a lot of tree cover, when it's cloudy, or in northern latitudes in the winter. That's why even though we do have solar, we carry a generator as a backup. But I tell you, when the sun is shining, it's a great feeling to be producing all that power without burning any fuel or making any noise. So that's just about everything I know about RV batteries. Did you find this video helpful? Did I miss anything? Jump into the comments and let me know. And in the meantime, keep on living the life you've imagined. I'll catch you next time. Testing, testing. We camp a lot of electric, electrical places. Make sure you don't miss the next video by liking, subscribing, and turning on notifications. Oh, and don't forget to check out our website and sign up for our weekly email blast. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you in the next one.